We have a great episode this week, um, just me and Laura this week chatting about first just this idea of when empowerment and sort of knowing your story meets these high level athletes. Um, we had the opportunity to work with two professional athletes last week and just giving some of our reflections on that um, and just, you know, how inspired we were by it. We also then just talked about the postseason. Obviously, postseason softball is underway. Nothing beats it. And this year is better than ever. Just tons of parody talk through what we're excited about, what we've already seen as postseasons kicked off. And then finally, we answered a question from Amanda Hazer, um, a dear friend of ours. Definitely follow her. Watch her stuff. Uh, great person, putting great stuff out into the world in women's sports. But she asked us any advice we had for our younger selves as an athlete. And so Laura and I answered that, um, got into that topic. So another great episode. Hope you enjoy. All right, we are back for another episode, and today you get the privilege of it just being me and Laura, I guess. So um, when Ashley and I don't really get rolling together, hopefully then that gives Laura some more space to to talk so we can hear her more. Um, Laura's become a very good listener in the last five years. (laughs) Uh, Part of the gig. So um, yeah, we're happy to be back. We are in the middle of postseason. I am set up with a TV behind me, so I will uh, try not to be too distracted by all the games going on right now. But it's it's we're going to get into this a little bit, but it's already been a super exciting postseason. So I am excited to keep watching. But um, today we were going to start by talking. So last week um, we had two uh, professional athletes in training with us. And, uh, it really sparked my brain on this idea of, I think one of the things that we really try to do at OGX is to empower athletes in the way that we have found to be really empowering for them is to tell them their story, whether that's through data, um, you can use a lot of things, right? Data means a lot of things. So it could be in-game data. It could be the data you're collecting in training for us. It's also our assessment piece. And we give them that information and sort of empower them to then lead their journey. And we're sort of see ourselves more as like the educators along the way. Um, And I think when we see this in its best form, it's really inspiring. And I felt that last week, obviously, um, you know, when you're working with adults who are sort of, uh, unfortunately, I guess what I would say for now, like sacrificing to stay in the game, um, in many ways. So hopefully that's not always the case, but they sacrifice a lot to, to continue to play at a high level. Their buy-in to like being the best version of themselves coupled with us giving this empowerment is just, it's very special. Um, and I just like, I don't know, the vibes last week were, were high, uh, and it, it was super fun to just be around that. So, um, I don't know if you have like initial thoughts on this concept, but I can kind of get into specific examples, but that was what sparked my brain on it. Like, you know, we, we sometimes on a day to day, I think forget about this concept or, or, you know, it doesn't always touch us in the same ways. And and last week was just such a really powerful example of it. Yeah. I, uh, I want to kind of relay this story. I, I said this directly to Alyssa. So hopefully if she listens to this podcast, this won't be a surprise for what I'm going to say, but <laughs> You know, I, when we met Alyssa at NFCA for the first time, you know, I was I was just so impressed with her her self awareness. You know, she, you know, she came up through the game in a time where data was not it wasn't really available to be honest. You know, neither did we, but it wasn't available. And she just the way she spoke about pitching, even from the first day we met her, I just thought like, man, this is a different mind. She's just got a, a different brain about how she thinks about herself as a pitcher. And that what she knows strengths and weaknesses. And that got solidified so much for me last week, being able to have her in our facility, you know, to do our full assessment process. Um, you know, she's going to head to UNO next week. We're going to get some really, really high quality data on her. But listening to her talk about her craft, and it's not that uh, our athletes on a regular basis, you know, our younger athletes or high school athletes can't do that. But it was just, it was a way uh, of talking about pitching that we don't get to hear a lot, you know? And so for her to, to be so self-aware, like she was talking about a particular hitter in AU that always kind of tripped her up that no matter what she threw her, um, it's Troy Dallas, by the way, but no matter what she threw her, it, you know, just could not, could not solve that scenario for that hitter. And she knew that without having any data in front of her, she just, she knows her craft and to hear her talk about pitching, 
was just, it was such a treasure. It really was. And I said that to her. It was just so cool to hear her talk about her craft in that way as she has just developed, you know, out of her college career through her professional career. And, you know, and it's not, this is no shot to Natalie by any means, but that was just a conversation that stuck out so much to me um, of listening to a, a high level pitcher like that, talk about her craft, to talk about, you know, the things that she sees, how she taps into different hitters, what she knows about herself to then pile on the data on top of it and give her all this information. I just think like, let's go, right. Let's, yeah. let's, let's go get that AUX crown. Let's go get that AU crown. Like, let's go. This is going to be so amazing. And, and to give her the, you know, the added depth and insight and, you know, uh, validation, I'm going to guess of what she already knows about herself, but for her to see that and feel that in the data and to see the results of that, to try new things, tap into different things, um, knowing what she can leverage. It was just such a, it was such a cool way to, to be able to hear a pitcher talk about her craft. And, you know, obviously Natalie is a, you know, as a professional athlete, as a catcher, as a hitter, you know, to hear them was, as they, uh, Natalie yeah. is standing in on some of the pitches that Alyssa right. threw, you know, to hear some of that trash talk, to hear Natalie's feedback of like, Ooh, that's a good pitch. Ooh, that's their eyes are just different. And it was, it was such a cool experience to have them in, you know, in the facility at the same time and, um, you know, sort of battling against each other, so to speak, but, you know, to hear them talk about their individual crafts like that. And it's something we just don't get to experience a ton because a lot of our athletes are so young and they're still developing yeah. that. And yeah. it was cool. It gave me, it gave me a lot of like, all right, here comes the summer program with all of our college athletes. Let's do this. And I want our high school athletes to hear those conversations. So it was cool. It was a, it was a really, really cool experience. Calling all pitchers and pitching coaches. Pitch Shack 2024 is your destination for revolutionary pitching education and information from the newest technology to advances in biomechanics knowledge to take home strategies and application for making your pitchers better today. Join us August 8th and 9th at the Weston O'Hare in Chicago. Experience transformative sessions led by leaders from the college game to technology companies to player development experts. Use promo code OGX podcast to take an extra 10% off. Visit go.ogxsoftball.com backslash pitch doc. Again, visit go.ogxsoftball.com backslash pitch doc and use code OGX podcast to take an additional 10% off spots are limited. So secure yours today. Yeah. I think the other reason we don't get to hear it often is because many professional athletes, unfortunately right now don't have the privilege to do this kind of training. That's right. Um, and so I think, you know, <clears throat> the high school athletes are more privileged in that way that they, at that point with their parents and everything can kind of do this training and, mm -hmm. um, for a variety of reasons, whether it's, you know, second jobs, uh, financial stuff, you know, limitations, our professional athletes can't train in this way. And it's just such a bummer because you have, you know, I think about Alyssa who, you know, I think at some point her, she kind of shared her story and, and we'll release that, um, in media form, but who was under recruited, um, who sort of just like keeps surprising people. It's like, everyone doesn't get it. Um, except it's totally obvious when you capture the data to understand why she's been successful. And so I think for her to have had so much success despite um, limited resources and, and understanding throughout her career and now, and to have just persevered and grinded and wanted to play the game and battled and had successes in all of this. And now to have met and crossed paths with us, um, and, and this ability to empower her even more to actually understand her story and to then go get even more than what she's been able to tap into, I think it's just such like a magical crossroads. Um, and so I'm so excited to watch where she's able to go from that. Um, and I think really, you know, similar about Natalie, like always love a person who's just like constantly grinding it out to, to be able to have this opportunity, um, you know, both of them have aspirations of playing also in the Olympics. And mm -hmm. unfortunately that's a, a long game. That's why I kept saying to Natalie is like, we're playing the long game. You got to make it, um, to 28. So, we, you know, we're, we're building to that. They obviously, Natalie wants to have success in the world cup this summer. Alyssa wants to have success in AU this summer, but then also this, like, keep my body performing for, you know, I have to look so far into the future now, which is 
really a bummer. It'd be much more fun if they were going to Paris this summer. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, there's this endurance aspect and I think it's, it's just like an incredible thing to be a part of, um, when people are that dedicated to it and we can help support that. Um, so I was joking with Natalie, but I, you know, again, I think this is speaking to kind of where the professional game is and the international game is right now, but Natalie's been training for like what probably feels like forever, you right. know, because right. they just, you know, they're, they're prepping, they play in the fall. Um, and now they're prepping for the world cup. It's like this one tournament, you know, for their, for team Canada. And so, uh, last week I was like, you need to go hit, like, we need to get you out of the cage and you need to go on a field and just like hit, <laughs> um, there's an element where you start going crazy, you know? So, um, but yeah, it just was powerful and, um, just great humans too. And I'm excited to, to continue to be a part of that. But, um, yeah, I think it was, I, yeah, I'm really excited about the the crossroads and, and helping them. So it's so, it's so yeah. unique to me too, but you mentioned like, you know, you, you got to go hit, you got to go see live pitch and you got to get on a field. I, I see this, this sort of, um, I don't know, this trajectory where we have, you know, our young athletes, they're doing nothing but playing games right. and training becomes this like, if I have time for it. And then you flip the script of you're coming out. Well, I say you're, you're heading into college where you, you are not in class eight hours a day. You're not in school. Like you're balancing a little bit more of, you know, the opportunities for training potentially it's, it's being driven by your college program. And then you head out into the professional world where you're saying like, you got to go find games to play, right? right? You're, you're training months and months and months for a, a competition that maybe, you know, maybe happens once a year, potentially. It's such a different, it's a different script, I think, as we, th yeah. we think about like those, those habits we've instilled on our younger athletes to attach to training so that when it comes time for, you know, their opportunities in college and professional, they're not bored by training, right? right. Or they have these habits built in and we're pushing them to go out and get game opportunities, not saying you're playing too many games and therefore that's affecting your performance. Right. It's, it's just such a flip-flop, I think, of what our game has got right now. Yeah. Well, and I think it's just a, a testament to, to like the type of training that we, that sticks, that works, which is not mm -hmm. like expecting a breakthrough in every session. Um, but it's also not mindlessly going through things. So one of the things Alyssa said to me was like, sometimes it's hard to feel motivated because I, I, I didn't really know what I was working towards. Like I feel really in control of the things I have. And so like the idea of going to throw a bullpen just felt like insane. Like, okay, I just like, go throw to throw, but I feel good about everything. Mm -hmm. And so she, you know, after her experience this weekend and sort of her for fuller assessment and, you know, now continuing to iterate on the program and training she's doing, she's like, I feel so much more intention behind when I go to throw of what I'm trying to do and what I'm trying to tap into. And I think, Natalie, on the hitting side, we had a lot of these conversations too of like, what does a hitting session look like? Um, and I think, you know, it's just a, a message of like, for our younger athletes, we see this same thing, which is like, you know, either I want a 30 minute window and I want to break through every time, you know, it's got to like feel good. And I, I really tap into something different that time. And, and I, you know, it's like a misunderstanding of what training is, or it's like this, like, it becomes this very like mindless mm -hmm. check the box type of thing. And so teaching this like empowered intention of like, yes, I go and there's intention behind it, but the intention is not always to like win the training day. Sometimes the training day is bad, but that also got me closer to where I needed to go. And, you know, I think teaching that mindset and like watching them as adults who are very much in control of their journey, navigate that, um, I think that's, that's what we should be trying to teach our athletes, um, as they go into it. So I think it, it's really powerful, yeah. um, to watch. Yeah. All right. Weekend. It was, all right. We're going to change as I see the Clemson, Virginia game behind me getting ready to start. <laughs> so we record these on Thursdays. Um, so we have one game, a game and a half, a day and a half, I guess, technically there was a game on Tuesday. So two and a half days of games under our belts. Um, and so. I'm just going to kind of talk about what we're looking forward to in the postseason. If there's big things to watch, um, really just right now talking kind of the D one level, obviously we have, um, some athletes that play at different levels also excited to watch them, um, battle it out. But I think what I already was so excited about this postseason was the parody in the game. Mm -hmm. Like there's no clear, it's not 
it's not so clear like, oh, well, all of this will be fun, but then they'll get to Oklahoma and Oklahoma is just going to sweep the house. Like, it's just not so clear this year. In addition to like, there's not a purse, you know, Oklahoma doesn't have the same like ring to it as it has, but also even under that, there's just within each conference, it's like, I don't know who's going to win the SEC. Like, I don't know who's going to win the Big Ten. Like, it's just, it's so, um, yeah, there, there's just so much parody. I was already excited about that. And I think so far, we have seen that to a level that is insane so with all of these extra so innings. So yesterday in the SEC, we had two 14 inning games. We, I watched, uh, I think it was nine innings, the U of I Minnesota game. Yeah. I, we just finished the Duke, uh, Boston college game that went into 10. Like it's just so much parody. It's almost crazy. And I also now as we're like, you know, turning the chapter on the next day, I'm like a lot of them, they went for it. They pitched, not in every single one. Auburn, Georgia, they I think there were multiple pitchers, but LSU, and, uh, Burzon, LSU right. pitched the whole game. Uh Jayla just pitched the whole game. Like there's a lot of where they're they really went for that game. And so then now I'm so curious of like <laughs> now what happens. Now what happens. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like now what are you gonna do? So I think uh LSU and Tennessee, I think last time I checked were on rain delay. So I don't know what's happening, but LSU has to play today. Um, so I'm just excited to see how they tackle it. Um, so I was already excited about that. A uh, Texas tech, uh, Iowa state. That was another crazy game, mm-hmm. crazy game. Um, so many like home runs and comebacks and, um, yeah, the games have just been, uh, they, they're definitely delivering the entertainment value. So if you are not watching softball, you're probably not listening to this podcast, but if you're not watching softball, you get on board. It's awesome. Yeah. I um I think we could kind of see this coming up from, you know, obviously the SEC gets a ton of attention, but, you know, just looking at like the final SEC you know, regular season rankings, it's like you had so many teams. I think the top uh, five had winning records in the SEC. I might be wrong on that, but top five had winning records. You had this group that were 500 and then you had a couple at the bottom. And it's like when I don't remember a time where the SEC had that much density in the middle yeah. and the middle is so interesting to me. It's what these matchups have been with Auburn and Georgia, you know, having Alabama and LSU go that 14 inning game. And, you know, it, it was a comment actually you made uh, last night in a, in a text message of like, this is, this is the challenge of when you ride one pitcher, right? It's like, yeah. you, you've got to see, you've got to see the same pitcher over and over again. And I give so much credit to Burzon and for LSU of throwing that many pitches for that many innings and, you know, holding Alabama to what they did. And it, it becomes this, like, like you said, it's like, well, now what, you know, you just, yeah. you had Maddie Penta throw a bunch of, of innings last night. You yeah. had all these, like, you know, uh, we sometimes get away from the staff. Mentality. Bridget like, Maryland. Bridget. Was, and one. Maryland's kept the same, um, to both sides. They yeah. like, say Maryland kept the same pitcher in for nine innings. I think their game went. 10. It's so interesting. Yeah. We talk about like staff mentality and I, it, and not that I feel like that goes out the window in the postseason, but it's been very clear. Like, Okay, yeah, you well, have they're that. all single elim, right? right? So like it's it's even You're different going than for it. it's different than even the regionals. Like each round yeah. of the postseason has this like different mindset. So when you're going for your you know conference tournament and it's single elimination, like it's mm-hmm. a little different. But even then when you go to regionals, it's not it's double elim, so that's different. And you go like each round, so then you do your your super regionals and that's a series, but then you go to the world series and first it's like double elim and that so like each round you kind of have to play pitchers different so i definitely understand especially for these teams where it's like if we don't make a run this is it you know so there's that mindset um and there's this combination i think i laughed we were watching the lsu alabama game in the office yesterday and uh when lsu finally scored it panned to burzon in the crowd and she was like ah! Like, like losing it. And I was just like, she's like, I can't throw anymore. You know, thank you. Um, and she just like all the, um, I mean, just like what came over her. Like I, I, I faced her, um, my team faced her in high school. So I've, and she's not like an overly emotional pitcher on the field. And when they pan to her and what came over, I'm just like, I can imagine the release of like how tired and sure. just like, you know, she's competing so hard for when they finally like scored. Um, and yeah, it's just postseason softball. Like there is just nothing. nothing. It nothing is like just, 
incredible. And I really love that at like 9 a.m. I could turn on my TV and watch <laughs> softball. So I very much appreciate the uh, conference tournaments. It's like the early tournaments when there's games literally like all day um, and you just like flip around on channels. It's very exciting. But yeah, I don't, I have zero. I mean, I think Texas has looked really strong all year. Um, but Oklahoma State has like beaten these people and Tennessee obviously is strong. And, um, but then like yesterday I turned on and like Mississippi state lost to South Carolina and technically that was upset, but I was like, that seems crazy. Like South Carolina has water and they have all these people. And like, how is that? So it's just kind of hard to, you know, I, I don't, I don't envy the like selection committee either. And these like rankings and who's going where, and it's going to be, um, really interesting obviously this is the last pack 12 mm-hmm. conference tournament so that's sad um especially shifting for softball the, shifting of the sec next year which yeah is in Oklahoma. a lot of right a lot of changes like a lot of last um yeah. this year as well i think obviously pack 12 for softball is just like sad to lose that right. it's just such a tradition for our game and um but yeah it's uh i don't know i got no predictions i'll be in okc for a little bit and i'm you know i don't know who will be there I know I, you, I wouldn't even put bets on it. If you know. asked me to put to fill out a bracket right now, I I mean I feel like you could pick four or five teams to just, and I don't think it's a, a they're going to dominate all the way. I think that's what makes it so challenging. It's that you're not going to see a single team just sail on through like maybe we've seen in past years. Yeah. That it's going to be it's going to be a battle, and I I think it's it is. I, I hate to say it's like it's anyone's national championship, but there are probably a select you know four or five teams right now that I feel like. They've all can vie for it. They all can go after it. They all could, you know, be that team and including Oklahoma, of course, but there, there is, there's just so much parody and I, it's, it's amazing. It's incredible. It's really good. for It's definitely good. And I think Mm -hmm. you could, there's like some arguments of like, Oh, pitching because some of the scores and then you get this like zero, zero Duke Boston college game into extras. You get the one, one Penn state Maryland game, like into extras. Like there's this, like, you know, it's just, I think, um, we could definitely argue sort of, uh, some of the things we're seeing in the game and the shifts, but I think at the the end of the day, it's just about parody and there is nothing better. Uh, it's not a better signal. I think of growth than getting into the college game and having, uh, you know, talent across the board, having some, the Abby Dunning is from this, our area. Um, and so that's awesome. She was Boston college to have the Boston college pitcher put up a zero for 10 innings against Duke, who's been, you know, incredible and, and having, yeah, I think it's just, it's super exciting. Um, I can't wait to keep watching. I know. Yeah. It's going to be a great weekend. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Today's question is from our good friend, Amanda Mazur, who, um, is incredible, I think. Uh, so she spoke at, um, uh, pitch talk last year and really works with athletes who are, transitioning. So obviously, um, unfortunately, I guess tying back to our initial topic, sometimes women, uh, athletes have to transition out of the game, uh, earlier than they may want to. Um, it's this idea of, of what that transition looks like, even if you play professional of like, what does it look like for me not to be an athlete? And she really, um, sort of like specializes in, in helping athletes with prep, you know, preparing for that. And then, uh, sort of like dealing with it when it happens and what that looks like. Um, and I wanna, so I want to ask you a story of how Amanda and I first met before you play. Her yes. Question. Yeah. It's, it's such a good story. So I went to the female athlete conference last year. Um, it happens every two years for the first time I had never been, it just, it was a opportunity that, you know, uh, it changed, I think it changed my career a little bit. Like it really gave me such a feeling of like, I'm, I'm home. I'm with my people, yeah. man. It was, it was everybody. It was doctors. It was, you know, medical professionals, coaches, admin, everything. And so I'm sitting in the, you know, went by myself, never been, I'm sitting in the, in the hotel lobby and uh, Amanda walks up and asks for a phone charger. And that led to a conversation that, you know, I'm so grateful that, that one, she asked that question and two, we had a chance to talk and, you know, we sat and talked for, for a little bit, kept crossing paths throughout the weekend. And, um, you know, when we were looking for uh, additional speakers for Pitch Talk, she just immediately came to my mind because, you know, her work in in change behavior and psychology and neuroscience and, you know, what goes into helping 
female athletes, you know, find their place in the world after their career is done, you know, is it's a need. There's a huge need, yep. not just from like the emotional side, but from the, what are the logistics of that? What does that look like for me? Right. What are things I have to think about? And I just, I thought her, her insightfulness and her, it's just empathy towards, you know, what these athletes experience, you know, I just, I feel so grateful that we made that very random connection over a, over a dead cell phone. So Amanda, if you're listening, I appreciate that because it led to an awesome conversation and I'm glad you're glad you're in our circle. All right, here we go. We have Amanda Hazer. I don't think she says her name at the beginning, but. Hi, Ashley, Krista, and Laura. Thanks for having these conversations. Um, really excited to, to follow along and, and just see how, how you all are doing. So one, one question I have for you was, if you had sort of one piece of advice to give your younger self as an athlete, <clears throat> what would it be? And um, would love to hear what the group has to say. I'll let you go first, Laura. I'm not oh, a... man. I knew you were yeah. going to do that to me. <laughs> I, you know, I had some time, I think, you know, I had some time to reflect on this because you prepared me for this. But, you know, I think back to the experience I had as a younger athlete and, you know, I, it's easy to say like, it was a different time, but it was kind of a different time. Yeah. You know, the ability to be a three sport athlete, the ability to, you know, not feel like I had to have this early specialization concept. I didn't play travel ball until I was well into my teens. And the, the I think the, the primary piece of advice, I say this a lot to people who ask about my softball background is I wish that I had been more educated about the high academic division three concept from a recruiting standpoint. I wish I had had a little bit more, and I'll get to the advice I would give in a second, but I wish I had been more exposure to that. And I, I think my, my best piece of advice that I would have given to myself is to find a home where you're most comfortable in all aspects, not just the softball aspect. And while the softball aspect of, you know, where I chose to play and, you know, how I chose to pursue academically what I, you know, ended up majoring in, I think my career would have been just a little bit different and how it shaped up and, and how it ended essentially from an injury standpoint. But to find your fit from a recruiting standpoint, explore all of the options, even the options that you don't think are things you'll even consider, you know, go to that, go to that random division three school that reached out to you, go do that, go look at that school, go connect with that coach and follow people, follow people, follow people and coaches that you feel comfortable with, attached with, you know, I'll say safe with, meaning that you can express who you are and, you know, and have some vulnerability. It's, it's something that I wish I had been a little bit more, I'll say like coached on, you know, of like, that fit isn't all about softball. It can be primarily about softball for sure, but there are so many other things about that time in your career in the college game that are important. And so the exposure to that from all kinds of, you know, different types of avenues for recruiting, but find your fit and explore options that you you didn't maybe think were going to be an option for you, whether you felt it was above you or beneath you, whatever, explore it all. Because you may find a place where the the version of the game you get to play is the best version of yourself in that game. And, and that is, I think that's the best, uh, that's our best hope for any of our kids in their college career is that they get to be the best version of themselves in that school, at that university, on that team playing sport. Um, and that's, that's what I would have given myself is explore it all, explore it all. Don't pigeonhole yourself into, I have to go, you know, D one or bust, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. figure that out for yourself. Find your fit. Yep. I think, um, the, the piece of advice I would give, I actually did receive, um, very late in my career, but, and I use this a lot, um, with athletes now, especially when athletes call me that are considering going into the transfer portal or are unhappy with where they are. Um, I always say like, what is best case scenario and what is worst case scenario? And I think what I would say to my younger self early on is like, what is best case scenario in this game? What does it look like? And really have answered that in depth um, to understand like why you're chasing what you're chasing. And I think, and, and believe that it can happen, but really understand, I think 
the reason I would say that is because uh, for my younger self, what I got into is like when things felt hard, um, I went very external sometimes or got frustrated, um, you know, got, uh, blamey with whether it was my coach or, or whatever. And my senior year of college, um, I had a particularly hard, we went on like spring break trips and I had a particularly hard where our coach had pinned me and my best friend, like sort of against each other to compete for this spot. Um, it's not worth getting into every detail, but I was, you know, very frustrated and, and just hit a point. And I went to dinner with my older brother and I, um, said like, you know, I, I think I'm going to quit. Like I, I just am so miserable. And, and he said, and then what? <laughs> um, and I was like, well, I'll, you know, I'll quit. And he's like, you know, like, where are your friends? Where are your, like, where's your life? Like, and so it was if you're, a kind if you're of Brett fashion, yes. of course, right? Yeah. If you're Brett fashion. Yeah. And so it was a little kind of like expectation setting. And I think we get into this a lot. What we see as we're around sort of high school athletes is that injuries as even though they should feel sad, it's not like you should just, you know, have some devastating injury and they'd be like, I'm fine. And that also is not healthy, but they become so devastating sometimes. And, or, you know, you, your path doesn't look exactly how you um, thought it would or think it should. And so then you're like, well, I should transfer. I should, I, you know, I should do these things. And I, I think it's sometimes because there's no context of like, well, what does it look like? What does this game look like? What does this role look like in the best case scenario? And I think when we really dive into that, um, and I think, you know, parents like listen to the answers of this, don't give them like, listen to the answers of this. It's a lot of the answers come down to like, I want to be a whole person, you know, recruiting becomes about like, I want to go to a place where I'm wanted. Like, I want, yes, I want to perform and I want to be on this stage, but I also want to feel like I'm supported. Like it comes down to all of these things. And so you start to realize like when it doesn't go exactly the way you thought it would, maybe from a performance standpoint, a question I ask, you know, I go back to the, like the transfer portal. I think it's a good example when people are thinking of that because they're, they're thinking of these things is even if you never step a, you know, step on the field, if that's the reason or, or whatever do you have the other things? Do you feel whole at that school? Do you like your teammates? And sometimes it's like, well, if that's true, like you might need to just shift expectations and, and what you're going for and what sort of like happiness looks like and, and all of those things. So that's what I would say. I, I think I kind of got it at the end and it allowed me to just kind of reshift my, my last year um, and do that. But I think the bottom line is like at the end of all of this, what does best case scenario look like? You know, and I, I ask the parents that sometimes of teams I coach and not always, but for 90% of them are my daughter's happy. She's these things. And, and I think we forget that. Mm -hmm. I think we forget that that's what we're all going for. Um, and we kind of sit, I think I shared this, I, I wish I remember who posted it. It was a Twitter post that a dad, um, who coaches, but it was his son's like last senior game of high school. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, he was talking about how during his career, he used to like sit and say like a mantra in his head to keep himself sort of like grounded. Like he is fine. I am fine. He's playing a game like, you know, and I think it sounds silly, but it's not, you know, I think that mindset of just staying centered on what it looks like to be best and best is not winning the world series, you know, could be on that playing professionally could be on that but I guarantee that's not the only thing on it. I guarantee there are much more pieces to that, um, that you got you that I think athletes should listen to more in themselves and should be able to like voice and stand up for more. I think, themselves. I think Amanda's work is it's so necessary. It's so necessary. We talk about athletic identity. You know, we've, we've had conversations internally about, you know, early sport specialization, not just from a physical standpoint is so challenging for our young athletes, but it ingrains, and an athletic identity in them so much younger than it was for us, you know, like identifying as I'm going to, I'm going to go to college for softball was something you probably didn't decide in our generation of playing until you were closer to the high school, Correct. 
level, you know, and then we, now we have, we have eight and nine year olds with, you know, Instagram profiles of recruiting. And, you know, you're like, wait a minute, hold on. She needs to be a whole person before the decision of even I'm going to pursue playing, you know, playing softball in college. And when, what, however your career ends, and I think we don't talk enough about involuntary versus voluntary involuntary, meaning, you know, an injury scenario you can't control that you did not make the decision that it's your time to be done with the game is incredibly devastating. But sometimes just as devastating is the voluntary end of right. your career that you you've reached a natural stopping point. You're not going to pursue a professional career or whatever might come next, or you're not going to pursue a college career. That's just as, just as much right. of a transition. And that, you know, that loss of identity when it's so centered around softball leaves such a gap. And, and, you know, that's what I experienced. I ended up not playing my senior year, secondary to injury and some other decisions about how I wanted my, um, you know, transition out of college to go to grad school. And I remember that time. I remember coming home that summer and just looking around like, okay, well now what, now what do I do? Who am I without this game that had just provided so much structure and love and, external validation for me growing up. What do I do without that? And I, I remember that summer just being very like, okay, it's time to kind of like rethink and refocus. And I feel very grateful I had those skills, but not everybody does or even recognizes that yeah. that's something they should talk about. Because and coach, so, coaches don't have those skills. If no, I was thinking is like right. th this work is just as valuable for coaches. You and I kind of talked about totally. this a little bit yesterday from like, when you go into coaching, um, at whatever level, even if you're just a youth coach and not just, but sure, you know, right. um, you get fed all of these things about your coaching because it's your passion and you need to be a servant leader and, you know, put yourself second. And, uh, there's like a variety of messages that get fed you. And I think for a long time, when I made the shift from, um, being a lawyer to going into coaching. Um, and obviously we, I wouldn't call what we do now just coaching, but, um, uh, <laughs> uh, but coaching is at its base is at its core. Um, that I, you know, what gets fed to you is like, I'm, I, this is my, this isn't my work. This is my passion. This is everything sure. I am. And so I'm supposed you to sacrifice. Get, right. And I mm -hmm. am supposed to do this all the time and I'm supposed to and that then sort of like perpetuates this with athletes is that I'm like, well, I'm giving everything for this. Like you should also. And so I think that there's an element of like, we perpetuate this. I think it's important also in the same way we've sort of gotten away from our younger selves here, but for coaches to learn how to also be full beans mm -hmm. to, to not be, um, threatened or, or, you know, um, threatened is the word I go to, but when, when we're teaching athletes to be the same to sure. yes, there's time and a place where like the game is the priority and you know, this is what you're focusing on. You're at a very high level and this is, you know, a main thing that you're contributing to. And also it's very important that you are a person who mm -hmm. functions and who has other passions and, and that the game is just the game. Um, and I think that there's this like balance. So, I think uh, when Amanda spoke at Pitch Talk, I think some of the, you know, a, a group of coaches were like, uh, <laughs> right. like, because it's like, what, you know, what we should let our athletes explore pottery if they're into pottery. Like, I think she talked about that because she likes pottery. And mm -hmm. I think all of the, you know, it's just a generation where it's like coaches, we don't know how to do that. And so sometimes I think we, we don't understand or, or get away. Our, our language always comes back to defining those people just by their athletic abilities. You know, yeah. I'm so proud of you because of yeah. your performance. I'm so proud of you because of, you know, X, Y, Z, instead of just like, it was so fun to watch you play. And I'm so proud of you for, you know, how funny you are. And I am so proud of you for this hobby you have. And, um, you know, I think it just gets really hard. So I think there's a lot of layers to this and we've seen it a lot. And I've said many quotes of, of sort of how shocking some of this is in this generation. But I think for me, the root of it is what does it look like if at the end of the, at the end of the day, your softball career goes exactly as you would want it to, like, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Um, and very quickly, I feel like athletes and I personally 
got into this very quickly. You get into, I'm with my teammates. I have friends. I'm supported. I'm connected. I'm at a place I, I like. And, and all of a sudden, like the softball performance, it goes lower and lower and lower. And it's not to say you should value that. You shouldn't value that. But I think it's important to like remind yourself of when you're in those harder moments and you're like, you know, why am I doing X, Y, Z or I'm injured. I'm out for a little bit or my journey's not going exactly as I wanted. But at the end of the day, for me, at the end of the day, I was surrounded by people who now, how much later are we? 20 years? <laughs> yes. 20. Yeah. I'm about to do my 25th high school reunion. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, mm. no. Tw- 20th, 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 20, 20. Yeah. So 19, whatever, 19 years college. <laughs> um, but those are still my best friends today, you know, yeah. and I was surrounded by those people. So that, you know, at the end of the day, that's what my brother meant is like, and then what you're still going to hang out with, like, mm-hmm. you're, like, and you know, so I just find your place. Yep. Yeah. And I think I, that's the important. I wanted to give just a, a quick shout out. I think it's just, it was such a cool, it was such a cool way to highlight the athlete. So um, I have a good friend in full disclosure, um, coach Brems at Lindenwood and, you know, she handles a lot of their social media. And one of the coolest things that I think they did over the season, their mantra was like in the arena, right? That was their mm-hmm. team mantra. And so their social media posts, they would highlight an athlete, highlight one of the players and they would call it outside the arena. And they did a whole, all these photo shoots of basically showing, you know, their players in context of the other things about them that right. make them who they are, whether it's something about you know, their chosen career path or a special interest or a hobby. And it was so cool to follow those posts over the course of the season, because you're, you know, you're following stats, you're, you're watching these athletes play and you realize like, Oh wow. She has a, you know, she has a jewelry business. I'm making this up, but she has a jewelry business or she is, you know, she's pursuing this, this career because of X, Y, Z. And you start to see the, the humanity in them, you know? And I think like, that's kind of, I think what I meant circling back to my own advice of follow people, follow coaches that make you feel your humanity, that make you feel like it's okay to be vulnerable. And, you know, that, that, you know, yes, softball performance can be at the top and that can be what we're striving for, but it doesn't replace who you are as a human being and all those things that make you tick. And I, you know, I think some of the, the sort of exhaustion of, um, some of the responses of exhaustion, I will say to Amanda's talk at pitch talk was like, we've kind of done this like mental health thing too much a little bit. I don't agree with that, of course, but I think I understand the context that we talk about it a lot, but what does it actually right. mean? Right. What does it mean to actually support our athletes in that space? And, and so that's the advice to my younger self is, you know, you find, find, a, find the coach as a human, as a person that you connect with versus just following the, you know, um, the high profile stuff you get along with being that level of an athlete, but right. it's, it's hard. You know, athletic identity is very, very tricky. It's very tricky yep. and complicated. Sure. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, good one, Amanda. You crushed yeah, it. That was a great, as question. always crush the question. Um, we appreciate all the work she's doing. She just was on, um, the w- women's shoot. I'm going to, I want to get the name right. Cause it's a great podcast. Um, the case for women's sports. I believe that's what it's called, but let me mm-hmm. make sure, but it's a um, great podcast. Definitely should listen all about women's sports. Um, she was just on the business case for women's sports. This mm-hmm. one's called, um, uh, and just all of the different things that are up and coming in women's sports and the business justifications behind them, different businesses that are having success in, in that space. And, um, it's a great podcast too. So listen to her episode, which is episode 89. I'm looking at it. Um, or just listen to the podcast in general. So, all right. That is all we have for today. I'm going to get back to, uh, watching postseason playoff. softball. Post, yeah. <laughs> postseason softball. We got Clemson, Virginia on my TV right now. I'm going to flip around and see what else is going on. And, uh, yeah, I'm not, you know, I want to like, I kind of want at the end to be like, go blah, blah, blah. I'll say go bears. Watch you. Uh, that's where I went. And <laughs> they're, uh, they're, uh, going to be at postseason soon too. So and go bears we'll just say go softball how's that go, go softball softball yes go softball everyone will watch all right until next week we'll see you guys then